Hello, my name is Alan Foom, and today I'm going to talk about petroleum licensing. Basically, licensing groundless lease sales. So, how do governments manage the oil and gas uh, revenues and bounty? So, it's a basic introduction. So, please do consult a commercial and gas professional or landman for more details for any specific country or state, because the regulations they all vary everywhere. So, please talk to the professionals. So, an exploration production contract is the right for a company to uh, explore for and produce hydrocarbons from any given territory. Also known as a license and lease, depends on, uh, again, where you are and how it's done. And they're awarded periodically by governments of host countries. So we're talking here about uh, basically the world outside the United States where you have private resource ownership. So how do all companies acquire resources? Now, I've got a video on that that looks at the specific uh, advantages and disadvantages of each of these methods. So the basic three methods, there's mergers and acquisitions, where you buy resources from other companies. Discovered resource opportunities, which is a special type of licensing round where a uh, field which has already been discovered is put up for licensing. And ground floor exploration, where you effectively get a, a new license, you drill a wildcat exploration well, which may or may not find how to carbon. So this is the riskiest, but potentially also has the largest rewards. The others have their own sets of risks and rewards, and I'll talk about that in that specific video. So just a quick summary of how it works. So basically, a company is bids for exploration lights from a government regulator. So the periodic lease rounds uh, administered by government bodies, such as the United Kingdom OGA, now the NSDA, Norwegian Petroleum Directorate, uh, you know, National Petroleum uh, Licensing uh, ANP, or DGH in India, you know, general regulators like that. Most countries have got them. And the companies compete for petroleum rights during these rounds by either a straightforward cash bid, also known as signature bonus, which is payable on award, by committing to a work program to ensure that the lease is uh, thoroughly explored, by bidding a share and a rate of return, many for PSAs, or a combination of both. It's all dependent on the individual country, and they all do things specifically different, uh, differently. National regulator receives the sealed bids by a deadline, then the regulator evaluates the bids and makes an award. So there, this is a map of different types of uh, oil exploration contracts. So you've got uh, in green are concessions, tax royalty systems. In yellow are production sharing contracts. Red are mixed systems where they've had different types of uh, contract at different times. A uh, map from uh, Reistad Energy, an oil and gas consultancy. I've got a video that explains what all these different uh, types of licensing contracts are and what they all do, which I'll link in the description. So please check that one out to explain that. But briefly, here we're talking about these two areas so concession tax royalty and production sharing contracts so concessions are examples of uk and norway psa is examples egypt malaysia and nigeria basically they are quite different but in terms of licensing they're similar because the government puts up acreage for licensing and this is roughly what the procedure is in most places so the regulator announces a licensing ground lease sale that's put out in the government gazette or government website and then uh, the companies then evaluate the available acreage and they have some time to do this typically six months or so before there's a deadline to submit a bid government submit a bid based on a performer the regulator then evaluates the bids and awards the licenses and a public ceremony um, sometimes they also disclose what the other bidders uh, bid and the license is then awarded and the license term starts and then the oil and gas company can uh, get on with, uh, with with the job of exploring uh, bid evaluation is obviously country dependent. Now, there are two basic things that, uh, that come in mind. The first one is a cash bid, where you have a straightforward bid of, a bit of money at the time of award. It's also known as a signature bonus. That's payable when the license is awarded, and then you do what you like. Or you can have a work program. So you bid a number of exploration wells with an evaluation program within the wells, geophysical surveys such as seismic data, CSEM, control source electromagnetic, to ensure thorough exploration of the block. The work for program can then include firmer contingent items and can also be phased. In some PSAs, you can also bid for a share of return, rate of return for governments, uh, or a royalty rate. That's kind of a little bit rarer. Most uh, bids now are either cash bids or work programs. Or there could be a combination of the above. It could be a combination of uh, cash bid and work program. License term length. Now, typically, licenses can have a variable length. It's obviously dependent on the country, but they typically vary between three to eight years, sometimes 10 years. They may be split into several phases. So, for example, an eight-year license, you can have a first phase of four years and a second phase of four years. Each would have its own work program. So, for example, a company can bid a seismic, a seismic program in phase one. And if they decide to go to phase two, they will then have to drill wells. 
Um, that's obviously advantageous from the company's point of view because if uh, the seismic does not find a, a prospect which they feel is viable, they can then get out of the end of phase one. License holder, when they do finish phase one, must relinquish a part of the, the acreage. Typically, it's half. So half the acreage typically goes back to the government after phase one is completed. Then uh, at the end of uh, the whole program, the whole of the acreage will be relinquished apart from any that uh, parts of the acreage which may have discoveries on them that have been made, which can may then be converted to production license. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Also, the license holder may have to pay a penalty if they don't complete the agreed work program. So they bid a well, but they can't get a viable well. They may have to pay a penalty to the, to the regulator, a financial penalty. There are also some normal license types. Now, some of these are being promoted in several countries. So first of all, there's something called a promote license. So this is a small company that does not have the capability of drilling a well, uh, would evaluate the acreage, uh, they may do geophysical surveys, and then they will try to farm in, uh, obtain a farm in from a larger company that's capable of drilling a well. So effectively, they're acting as a promoter on behalf of the government authorities. You can have a short-term license called a drill or drop. So a company has a less than two-year term, they evaluate the data on the license, and then they make a decision to either drop, drill the prospect or to relinquish the license. So to churn the acreage over quickly. Then the GROs, discovered resource opportunities. So this is when you have a discovery that already exists, but it's not been developed, and a company may apply to develop it. Uh, this is quite common in many uh, countries with, uh, with PSAs, uh, where you, the state oil company may have made a discovery and they want someone else to come in and, uh, and develop it for them, basically with the risk and, and uh, the capital requirements. Uh, I talk a little bit about that in my video on different types of exploration contracts. Or you may have field redevelopment. So a field has been producing, it has been decommissioned, but someone else may come in and uh, develop it again using new wells, new technology, new facilities. An example of that is the Argyle field in the UK, CS, um, which is originally developed by Hamilton Brothers as Argyle, later decommissioned, then developed as Alma, and then developed as Galia. Um, it's been around quite a while. People come in, develop it, produce it for a while, then eventually um, the water ingress comes in, and then they stop, and then someone else comes through. Another novel type of license, which has been uh, awarded quite recently and has been a big emphasis on this, is carbon captured storage. So you define and develop a CCUS opportunity um, with facilities, etc. And the UK, for example, has recently had a carbon capture and storage round where six areas have been awarded for potential licensing for carbon capture and storage. So this is a new and innovative uh, development uh, here. And also in Norway, it's now coming out to other countries. Now, each license would have an operator. Now, a company would be designated as such, and they're responsible for all the activity on the license. They plan, supervise the well drilling, the seismic, which is actually done by contractors, but the operator supervises it and uh, puts everything together. They evaluate all the data, and they coordinate with government authorities. So they're the first people that the government would speak to. Operators are screened by the government authorities, and they must meet some criteria. So, for example, they have a operating technical capability, including safety environment, so they can actually do the work safely and responsibly financial capability, and then corporate governance, fit and proper person to ensure that, uh, that uh, they do a, a reasonable job. But there are very few companies that go in 100%. So quite often you would have a joint venture. Now you form a consortium. It's based on sharing risk costs and you obviously share the reward. Um, if you have 25% of uh, four things that are potentially quite large, you, you give yourself more exposure for the same money. Uh, operators appointed to lead the consortium and other co companies are non-operated JV partners. Now, they do some of their own work to basically keep an eye on operator, guide and advice operator, and I've done that, uh, I feel, quite successfully in the past. Uh, consortiums are governed by joint operating agreements to ensure that everything's done correctly, so that's a legal agreement uh, negotiated by the commercial negotiators and the, and the lawyers. The operator's direct costs are also funded by the joint venture, together with obviously all the other costs are fully shared. The partners may sell, swap, relinquish their share. So let's say you've got uh, four partners, 25% each. One of them is an operator. If one of the partners doesn't want to go ahead with phase two, they can then drop out and then their uh, share is then pro rata amongst the others. Uh, obviously, the authorities will need to uh, approve change of control. So if there's a new operator coming across, the operator is the one that wants to relinquish, but one of the other partners will stay there, and your operator must be approved by the, by the government. And also, if you've got a national oil company, particularly in PSA regimes, they may have back-in rights. So they basically go back, go into the joint venture after discovery has been made, pay some of the back costs, and then are 
to then become a full partner. But that obviously depends on the individual situation within an individual country. Now, once your exploration license comes to an end, if you've made a discovery, hooray, champagne calls start popping. Uh, you can then carve out that particular portion as a potential production license. Now, in Nigeria, for example, you have difference between OPL, or prospecting licenses, and OML, or mining licenses. Other countries use similar sorts of terms. Then the consortium submits a development plan for the field. Uh, if they deem it to be commercial, if they don't deem it to be, uh, the field to be commercial, then, then they just relinquish the area, and that could be then licensed by the government in the future, potentially as a DRO. The authorities may grant field development consent and approve the field development plan if everything's uh, fully there. And then you would have a production license, which may be the life of the field. That's normally the case in tax and royalty systems, such as the UK, or could be a fixed term, for example, 25 years, which is most common PSAs. Obviously, varies by country. Please talk to the appropriate experts within your company. A little bit about license blocks. So they're obviously very country dependent. Uh, also offshore versus onshore, federal versus local, but this is an example from the UKCS. So uh, this is from the North Sea Transition Authority, the main UK uh, regulator, and they divide the United Kingdom continental shelf into quads and blocks. Quads are one degree latitude by one degree longitude. Original blocks were uh, 10 minutes by latitude by 12 minutes longitude, so basically 30 per quad. But then blocks would be subdivided of the following relationship. So this is block 22, 30, so that's 2230C, so that's Elgin Field, 295B, that's the Franklin Field, 2230B, that's the Shearwater Field, and then 2230A, Merganser and Scota. Um, and this particular bit of acreage in the middle here is currently unlicensed and will be available in the next licensing round. So again, period of each one of these uh, bits of acreage would have been licensed separately, people would have drilled wells on it, etc. So this is a block that has quite a lot of part blocks because it's had some success and some non-success in some other areas. And as you can see, these dots here are the wells that have been drilled. Other North Sea countries, for example, Norway, tend to use similar systems, but they have different block sizes. Other countries use something completely differently entirely. Please consult, obviously, with your local experts. So just to sum up, each country will have its own licensing leasing system, so please consult the appropriate people within your organization or have a look at uh, people like SB, uh, Wood Mackenzie, etc., the uh, Reistad, that give you some details of what's going on. And obviously, the regulators would have their own websites if you want to find that same thing out. Country authorities that regulate, promote petroleum licensing, they want to have a safe and economic development of their old bounty to do everything in a safe, responsible, environmental manner. They held periodically licensing round to ensure that uh, the licenses are distributed in a transparent and competitive manner. The licenses will have a fixed term and will be relinquished at the end of the term. The relinquished acreage can then be re relicensed at a later licensing round. Companies that apply for these licenses, judge on criteria such as work programs and cash bid, very competitive manner to ensure that um, the country's bounty is, uh, is uh, distributed in, in the best way for the country. So thanks very much. Please like, please subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one. Thank you very much.